hear a student called Joanna telling her friend about an arts festival, which is being held in the city where they are studying. First, you have some time to look at questions one and two. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one and two. Hi, Joanna. Where have you been? Hi, Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh, right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh, yeah. I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah. And I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full programme of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone, though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see. An Italian film, a rock concert and an art exhibition. Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out. Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door, because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the 20th, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh, look, it's 0967 990 776. OK, I'll write it down. 0967 990 776. Thanks. I thought the local council made a profit from the festival, but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor. It's a local bank. I didn't know that. Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the City Hall. Ugh. That's only £3.65 for students. Mm, I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then, and that's only £2.50 for students. Sounds good. Is that in the City Hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the Sports Centre if you're interested. Oh, right. Thursday's the cheapest event, only £1.25 for students. 
And it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> Actually, no. They've not been asked, apparently. Oh. No, it's a poetry evening. Hmm. Isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday. That's at the college. It's quite expensive, though. £15 for adults and £12.75 for students. Oh, yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. But on Saturday night, there isn't live music or a party or anything. Just the fireworks in the city park. And that's only £1.50. Yeah, that'd be good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between two women about the health system in England. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, Mrs Sutton. Come in. How are you settling in next door? Have all your things from Canada arrived yet? I thought I saw a removals van outside your house yesterday afternoon. Yes, they came yesterday. We spent all day yesterday arranging them. It's beginning to feel a bit more like home now. Oh, that's good. Look, come in and sit down. Are you all right? You look a bit worried. Well, I am a bit. I'm sorry to bother you so early, Mrs Smith, but I wonder if you could help me. Could you tell me how I can get hold of a doctor? Our daughter, Anna, isn't very well this morning, and I may have to call somebody out. She keeps being sick and... <sighs> I am beginning to get a bit worried. I just don't know how the health system works here in England. All I know is that it's very different from ours back in Canada. Well, I don't know really where to start. Let me think. Well, the first thing you have to do is find a family doctor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we call them general practitioners as well. Right. And register with him or her. If you live here, you've got to be on a doctor's list. If you're not, things can be a bit difficult. Oh. Nobody will come out to you if you're not registered. Anyway, the work in things called practices, uh -huh. sort of small groups of family doctors all working together in the same buildings. Now, what you've got to do this morning is register with one of them. Oh. There are two practices near here, so we're quite well off for doctors in this part of Manchester. There's the Dean End Health Centre, about mm, ten minutes' walk away. And there's another practice in South Hay. That's about five minutes away, going towards the town centre. Uh -huh. We are registered at the Dean End one, but they're both OK. There are about six doctors in our practice and four in the other, so ours is quite big in comparison. And the building and everything's a bit more modern. South A is a bit old-fashioned, but the doctors are OK. Their only problem is that they don't have a proper appointment system. Sometimes you have to wait for ages there to see someone. Mm. Anyway, you go to the receptionist 
in whichever health centre and ask her to register you with a doctor there. You have to fill in a form, but it doesn't take long. Ours is called Dr Jones, and we've been going to him for years, ever since we moved here 15 years ago. I wouldn't say he's brilliant, but um, I suppose he's all right, really. We're used to him now. <laughs> they say he's very good with elderly people, but he does tend to get a bit impatient with children. Listen, the one who's supposed to be really good with small children is Dr Shaw. Ah. I've heard lots of people say that. Mm -hmm. She's young and she's got small children of her own. So you could try registering with her. And if her list's full, I heard somebody say the other day that there's a really nice young doctor at South Hay, a Dr Williams. Mm -hmm. He holds special clinics for people with back trouble, but uh, that's not really your problem, is it? <laughs> now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 18 to 20. If you want a doctor to visit you at home, you have to ask for a home visit. You're supposed to do that before 10.30 in the morning, but obviously if it's an emergency, you can phone at any time, night or day. It might not be your doctor that comes, though. It's quite often one of the other doctors in the practice. It doesn't really seem to make much difference. Right. Otherwise, you make an appointment to see your doctor at the health centre. You usually get seen the same day. Not always, of course, but usually, as I say. They hold surgeries between 9 and 11.30 every weekday and from 4 to 6.30, Monday to Thursday. Saturdays are only for emergencies. I see. When the doctor sees you, he gives you a prescription... He writes what medication you need on it and you take it to a chemist shop. There's one opposite the centre. If it's for a child under 16, you don't have to pay. So if it's for Anna, there's no problem. The same thing goes if you're unemployed or retired or if you're pregnant. Just as well, because it's not cheap. You pay the same price for each item the doctor has prescribed. At the moment, it's something like £5 per item. So you pay for the medication, but the consultation with the doctor doesn't cost you anything. It's completely free, as long as you're a resident here. Mm -hmm. You're going to be here for three years, aren't you? Uh-huh. So, well, there shouldn't be any question of you paying anything to see the doctor. Mm. So that's one less problem to worry about. <laughs> Look, Mrs Sutton, if you want, I'll sit with your daughter for half an hour if you want to go down to the health centre to register. It's no trouble, really. Don't worry. Are you sure you wouldn't mind? That would really help me a lot. I'll ask them if they can send someone round later to see Anna. I, I think I'll try the Dean End Centre. Good idea. Don't worry about Anna. Right. I'll be back as soon as I can. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two students called Jimmy and Kathy talking to their tutor about the current research paper. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Before we start, Jimmy and Cathy, thanks for coming in today to talk about your current research paper. Well, I will also give you some suggestions for your future presentation later. That's great. OK, I've read the introductory chapter, and so far I like where you're going with your research, you two. Thanks. What did you think of the procedure section? I haven't got there yet. I'll get to that and the results and discussion section in a bit. Oh, if you haven't read the rest, are you just saying you like the introduction? No, the layout is really well done. You have each section clearly marked and have the header and footer perfectly formatted, and your title page is right on the money. A lot of students have trouble with that one. To be honest, we did refer a lot to the example we received in class. That's good to do for spacing and layout, as long as you're not also copying the information. The background information is a little sparse, though. You may want to add to it. You think so? I was more worried about whether I had enough data. You definitely need more background information. I would think about finding some more online articles or doing more research in the campus library. That's a good idea. We can go tomorrow. I find it too tough finding the subject matter in the online journal database. I also like being able to flip through the physical journal as opposed to trying to scroll down on a computer. Me too. Oh, I almost forgot. I've included all of my citations in the abstract. But could you help me with the bibliography? I should be using a bibliography, right? Not an appendix. Sure, I can help with that. Yes, for this type of scientific research paper, list all sources that you cite in the body of your paper in a bibliography. Go to the website I gave you last time to see the exact way to list each source. OK, thanks. I'll do that. We still have a lot of things to fix up. Yeah. But there's a lot of good stuff here to work with. So, enough about the paper. How is the presentation going? Well, it's all right. I'm going to go try out the new presentation software while Jimmy's working on the bibliography. Yeah, we are hoping to make an animation of an actual pump, but still have a lot to learn about how to do that. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. Who would have thought before we started this project that we would be able to recreate the motion of a pump? This stuff is just so interesting. So glad to hear it. Yeah, I am glad I took engineering this semester. I would definitely like to keep up with it. You know, there's an organisation called the Machine Engineer Society. You should look into joining it. You would need to score well in your engineering class to qualify, but I think you can do it. Hmm, interesting. I will definitely check it out. I would really like to get in contact with some professionals in the engineering field to find out more. I don't really know anyone in the field now, though. I think if you keep meeting people in your classes and professors, you'll, you'll be able to get in contact with some really helpful people. Well said, Jimmy. If engineering pumps is something you both are specifically interested in, make sure you stay up to date on new developments. In fact, you could visit the local water treatment facility periodically to see what new developments are going on. Hmm, that may be a good way to get some practical experience. Well, I don't think they would let you handle any equipment by just visiting the facility. If you really want to get your hands dirty, so to speak, I would recommend instead seeking a summer internship. 
Wow, you have so many helpful suggestions for getting a leg up. Now, if only you could tell me how to get my work published. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Well, honestly, all you really need to do is once you have a dissertation, present it. Present it often and to many audiences, and once you get feedback, adjust it. You'll get published one day. Wow, this meeting has been truly inspiring. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a postgraduate psychology student talking to other students about a job satisfaction study he has investigated. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. For my presentation today, I'm going to report on an assignment that I did recently. My brief was to analyze the methods used in a small study about job satisfaction, and then to make recommendations for future studies of a similar kind. The study that I looked at. Had investigated the relationship between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction amongst workers. For this purpose, employees at a call center had been asked to complete a questionnaire about their work. I'll summarize the findings of that study briefly now. First of all, female full-time workers reported slightly higher levels of job satisfaction. Than male full-time workers. Secondly, female part-time workers reported slightly higher levels of satisfaction than female full-time ones did. On the other hand, male part-time workers experienced slightly less job satisfaction than male full-time workers. But although these results seemed interesting and capable of being explained. Perhaps the most important thing to mention here is that, in statistical terms, they were inconclusive. Personally, I was surprised that the findings hadn't been more definite, because I would have expected to find that men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would experience different levels of satisfaction. So I then looked more carefully at the methodology employed by the researchers. To see where there may have been problems, this is what I found. First of all, the size of the sample was probably too small. The overall total of workers who took part in the survey was 223, which sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into subgroups. Also, the numbers in the different subgroups were unequal. For example. There were 154 workers in the full-time group, but only 69 in the part-time group. And amongst this part-time group, only 10 were male, 
compared to 59 who were female. Secondly, although quite a large number of people had been asked to take part in the survey, the response was disappointingly low. A lot of them just ignored the invitation. And workers who did respond may have differed in important respects from those who didn't. Thirdly, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call center for distribution, the researchers had had very limited control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For instance, their responses to questions may have been influenced by the views of their colleagues. All these problems may have biased the results. In the last part of my assignment, I made recommendations for a similar study, attempting to remove the problems that I've just mentioned. Firstly, a much larger sample should be targeted, and care should be taken to ensure that equal numbers of both genders and both full and part-time workers are surveyed. Secondly, the researchers should ensure that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves. And should they require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions so that the possibility of influence from other colleagues is eliminated? Finally, as workers may be unwilling to provide details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's important that the researchers reassure them that their responses will remain confidential and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time if they want to. By taking measures like these, the reliability of the responses to the questionnaires is likely to be increased, and any comparisons that are made are likely to be more valid. So, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? If you enjoy this content, please like and subscribe. After subscribing, please leave a comment below saying subscribed and we will respond as soon as possible. By subscribing, you're supporting our mission to help others achieve their IELTS goals. Thank you so much for your support.